I'd like to say good evening and welcome to the 10th annual Manette Phelps Lecture here at Iowa State University. As many of you know, this lecture was scheduled in the fall and had to be rescheduled. And in that brief time between the rescheduling and now, you have a new president. So those of you that don't know me, I'm Steve Leith, and I am delighted to be here tonight and participate in my first Manette Phelps Lecture. This series was established in 2002 with the goal of bringing to Iowa State an international leader to address significant developments in the international political arena and related to Iowa. There have been many outstanding speakers, including prominent government officials, international diplomats, and global business leaders, and tonight's speaker certainly carries on that tradition. This lecture series was established by two of our distinguished alumni, Tom Phelps and the late Ambassador Charles Manette and their wives Elizabeth Phelps and Kathleen Monette. Kathleen is also an alum of Iowa State. We're delighted that Tom could be with us tonight. A little history here. After graduating from Iowa State, both Ambassador Monette and Mr. Phelps attended George Washington University Law School. Then they co-founded the Monette, Phelps, and Phillips Law Firm, which is today a leading national and international legal firm in a number of cities around the world. We were greatly saddened last fall by Ambassador Manette's death. And his loss is especially felt at an event like this that he, Kathleen, Tom, and Elizabeth established for Iowa State University. Ambassador Manette was a dominant figure in U.S. politics and international diplomacy in the latter part of the 20th century. He served as chair of the Democratic National Committee from 1973 to 1989 and led the Clinton-Gore presidential campaign as chairman. He also served as U.S. Ambassador to the Dominican Republic. Throughout his life, he gave generously of his time and talents to organizations such as the National League for Public Interest, the Mayo Clinic, and both of his alma maters, George Washington and Iowa State University. Iowa State was honored to present him with the university's highest award in 2008, the Distinguished Alumni Award. We prepared a brief tribute to Ambassador Manette that we're going to show now. Now, I'd like to ask Tom Phelps to come forward. And while he's coming forward, I want to tell you just a little bit about him. Mr. Phelps is one of the nation's leading banking attorneys and has served in leadership positions with several industry and banking associations. He and Elizabeth are very active in the Los Angeles community, supporting many community projects, health care organizations, and services. Please join me in welcoming Tom Phelps. Thank you very much, President Leith. Uh, this is your first official duty? Not really. Um, and um, um, Cong Congressman Hamilton, uh, deans, distinguished faculty, students, uh, members of the community, uh, it is a pleasure for me to be here uh, to uh, address you and give uh, a couple of minutes of remembrance of, of Chuck Manette. Um, uh, Beth and I and Chuck and Kathy have been very privileged to be a part of this lecture series and it has been a blessing for us to come and join with you. Uh, this is the tenth in, this, in the series of these lectures as you know. So let me tell you a few words about Charles Taylor Manat. Uh, he was my friend for 56 years and my law partner for 46 years. Uh, his brother Richard is here, right over there. Many of you uh, know Richard because he's been on the faculty here and he and, and Jackie, Jackie still uh, live here in, in Ames, Iowa. Uh, so uh, some of you have heard Dick's version of, Ch of what it was like to live with Chuck Manat as a kid. Uh, I'll try not to repeat any of those uh, stories that I've heard, but uh, fill in a little bit from 
my brief 56 years. There may be somebody in this room other than Richard who uh, has known Chuck Manat longer than I, but uh, maybe not. I may be the... Uh, c certainly, I've, I've known Chuck longer than Michelle, who is Chuck's uh, oldest child. Michelle is going to come up here in, in a moment. Uh, one of my favorite pictures of myself with Chuck and Kathy uh, was standing in front of our first office building. Michelle was about this tall. I don't know how old she was at that time, but... Um, so, um, those people that I just mentioned know Chuck very well and fondly, and maybe some of you do too. <clears throat> but I would like this remembrance to uh, be addressed to the majority in this room. Um, people who do not know Chuck at all or do not know Chuck well, um, uh, especially to students. So, who was this guy? And why does it make any difference uh, who he was? Uh, I don't think I need to repeat Chuck's resume. Uh, you heard some of it from the president. Uh, he has been a phenom. He has done more in his lifetime than most of us in two or three lifetimes. Uh, he was right here at Iowa State. He was the student body president. Uh, he was a member of the Cardinal Key. Uh, he was the co-founder of the law firm with me, Manette Phelps and Phillips. Uh, he was several times over a bar president uh, back in Los Angeles. He was the founder and the chairman of the board of a bank called First Los Angeles Bank in Los Angeles. He was elected chairman of the California Bankers Association. Who to thunk, an Iowa farm boy being elected to the uh, head the California Bankers Association, but it happened. He was the chair of the California Democratic Party twice, and he was the chairman of the National Democratic Committee. And as uh, the president said, he was the United States ambassador to the Dominican Republic. He was also the chairman of the Board of Trustees of George Washington University, speaking of community activities. Uh, he was the chair of the International Foundation for Election Systems. Uh, and on and on and on. So what I really want to tell you about is what, what, what are the takeaways for Chuck Manette, for all of you who have not known him well. I want to leave you maybe with six very quick points. The first one is Chuck Manette had a passion for learning. He was interested in everything, and he was interested in everybody. His curiosity had no limits. Uh, he never stopped learning, and by the way, none of us should ever stop learning. Secondly, he worked hard. He worked hard and he played hard. Uh, and he thoroughly enjoyed both hard work and hard play. He was the kind of a guy, as a law partner of mine, who would start his day at 9.30 in the morning I used to make this joke about bankers, you know, 10 to 3. No, he was 10 in the morning until 3 the next morning. And then he would say, it's time to go out and have a cocktail. So he was a prodigious worker. In fact, that's the reason why the people down in Santo Domingo, uh, Dominican Republic, used to call him Hurricane Charlie. Because that's the kind of a United States ambassador he was. And that's the kind of a person he was. <clears throat> Chuck Manette had a zest for life, uh, and it was contagious. Uh, a simple lunch with Chuck Manette was an inspiration. So he loved politics, and he loved pu public policy. If he were here with me today, we would be talking about what happened in front of the Supreme Court today. Uh, he, uh, he loved golf, he loved tennis. And he loved Iowa, and he loved the Iowa farm that he and Kathleen uh, still maintain today. He cared about people. There's a good lesson for all of us. Everybody around him, from students to his parents, to his partners, to his employees, his clients, and his family. And I say that because he cared about them individually. And he was the kind of a man who would make you feel that he did really care about you. 
and it was a great support for me, personally. He had the heart of a servant. Uh, he loved to give himself away. Uh, his time, his ideas, his advice, his financial resources. Uh, I would say university benefited by that. So did George Washington University. So did the Music Center in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, but especially uh, Iowa State. It was close to his heart. Giving back was a part of Chuck Manette's DNA. And the last point I want to mention is that he was a natural leader. Now why would I mention that? You know, how many of us can be natural leaders? Um, well, we can't all in this room start a law firm. We can't all be an ambassador. Uh, we can't all head a political party um, or a university. But to tell you the truth, friends, that's not the point. The point is, and this, this is what Chuck would say, each of us needs to take advantage of our natural resources, our education at Iowa State University, and make the most of it, and, 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 and make a mark uh, on humanity. And he would say to you today, every one of you is a leader. You may not see yourself as a leader, but in what you do and what you don't do, you influence the people around you, and people are watching you, and you are, for that reason, a leader. So Beth and I have lost a great friend. Uh, you all have lost a great friend. Uh, he was a great friend. He was a friend of the doorman at our office building, all the way from a doorman to a head of state. He was that kind of a person. He stayed in touch, and he redefined the word friendship. So that was Chuck's legacy. Uh, Iowa State is woven into the fabric of that man, and we will always remember him. Now I would like to introduce uh, his daughter, Michelle Manat. Would you come forward, Michelle? Hello and good evening. I'm Michelle Manat, and I'm the daughter of Charles T. Manat and Kathleen Manat, who are both alums of Iowa State. Uh, it is a distinct pleasure for me to be here this evening representing my entire family. My mother was not able to be here tonight, but given that this is the 10th anniversary of this lecture, we thought it was very, very important that a member of our family be here. It is also remarkably appropriate and touching for me to be here to be waiting upon the words of Congressman Lee Hamilton, who I had the pleasure of working for for almost a year in 1993 when he was the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and I was one of his committee aides, otherwise known as a staffer. There have been a lot of good staffers over the years. I hope I was a good one, and I hope I've helped to mentor others. Uh, my father and mother, but my deceased father, would be extraordinarily touched and delighted to see this kind of a crowd joined here tonight on a beautiful spring evening. He preferred spring to winter. That was not a secret. And to be able to hear about one of the most important issues of our time, which is where we're headed after our engagement in Iraq and Afghanistan, and all of the blood and treasure and extraordinary commitment that our country is making to that part of the world. So we are in for an extraordinary treat. And I want to thank President Leith and, and Janet for welcoming all of us tonight and wish them the best in their very new assignment, something very exciting for Iowa State to have a North Carolinian spending some important years here. So thank you very, very much for continuing the tradition and we hope that there will be another marker 20 years from now with another Manat Phelps lecture. Folks, on behalf of Iowa State University, I want the Phelps and Manettes to know how grateful the Iowa State community is for their generosity and support. It makes me proud as a president to stand here and see the affection and support Iowa State University generates from its friends and alums. It also makes me proud that when our friends and alums do something so generous that the response and appreciation from the Iowa State community is so overwhelming we had to bring more chairs in tonight. So that just delights me. I also want to thank the political science department who hosts this lecture every year. I want to ask Dr. James McCormick to come forward tonight and introduce our speaker.
Thank you, President Leith, for that kind welcome. And thanks to Tom and Michelle for their wonderful tribute to Ambassador Manad. Uh, I was deeply moved by these six points. They could not be truer from my experience and my interaction uh, with Chuck Manad. Uh, he w we are deeply in his debt for this lecture series, for making it su such a success. As many of you perhaps know, uh, I've shared this with others. He was so instrumental in getting all of our speakers and uh, supporting this effort as, along with Tom. And uh, we cannot thank the Manat family and the Phelps family uh, enough. His presence as we uh, had dinner tonight and joked a little bit about Chuck and how he would uh, interact, he really will be deeply missed and uh, for, for a very, very long time. And I'm very proud that uh, we're able at Iowa State to have this Manat Phelps lecture as a tribute to uh, both uh, Chuck and Tom. As already noted, and I just would formally thank again, that uh, there's been a generous gift by uh, both uh, Chuck and Kathleen and, and uh, Tom and Beth uh, for, this, uh, for this lecture series. And the aim of this lecture series, as the President noted, is to bring a distinguished scholar or practitioner to campus who can speak to uh, significant global issues in the political or economic uh, area. Our aim has been to make this sort of the premier event um, over the years on global politics, on the economy in Iowa. And I believe that we have really met that standard and I'm very deeply pleased uh, to have such a distinguished speaker tonight to address this lecture theme. Our speaker is uh, the Honorable Lee H. Hamilton, longtime congressman from Indiana, distinguished public servant and foreign policy expert. He has served in various governmental and non-governmental capacities during the last nine presidential administrations, beginning with President Lyndon Johnson through President Barack Obama. And during that time, uh, Congressman Hamilton has been and continues to be a highly respected voice on the crucial foreign policy issues facing our nation. Indeed, his substantial experience and significant contributions over the years have made him one of the most highly respected public servants in our country. In that sense, it is a great honor that he joins us this evening. Congressman Hamilton received his undergraduate degree from DePaul University, his law degree from Indiana University, and studied for one year at the Goethe University uh, in Germany. In 1964, he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives uh, from the 9th District of Indiana, Southern Indiana, and was re-elected for an additional 16 consecutive terms, retiring in 1999. During that congressional tenure, he became a leading congressional expert on American foreign policy and led some of the most important committees in that body as was noted by Michelle Manat, the Committee on Foreign Affairs. He also uh, headed the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the Select Committee to Investigate Covert Arms Transactions with Iran, or more popularly known as the Iran-Contra Committee. After his retirement from Congress in uh, 1999, he was chosen to serve as president of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C where he led that institution with distinction from 1999 through 2010. During this past decade, too, Congressman Hamilton was chosen to serve on two important national panels to address key homeland security and foreign policy challenges. After the 9-11 attacks, he was appointed as vice chair of the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States, or again, more familiarly known as the 9-11 Commission. In 2006, he was appointed by Congress to serve as co-chair of the Iran Study Group. That group issued some 79 recommendations on the way forward in Iraq in December of 2006. At the present time, Congressman Hamilton serves on a plethora of boards, uh, including an intelligence board for the FBI, uh, for the Department of Energy's Blue Ribbon Commission on America's uh, nuclear security. 
He said tonight that he's going to cut down on his commitments, but I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> um, that service does not represent all that Congressman Hamilton has done and continues to do. He currently serves as the director of the Center on Congress at Indiana University. The center is a nonpartisan educational organization established in 1999 that seeks to improve the public's understanding of the workings of Congress and inspire greater public involvement in revitalizing representative government in the United States. The center offers an extensive array of civic education resources and activities to meet these important goals. In all then, Congress um, and Hamilton is uniquely qualified by background and experience to discuss with us a broad array of foreign policy issues. In this sense, we are especially privileged to have him address us this evening on the topic of American foreign policy after Iraq and Afghanistan. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Congressman Lee H. Hamilton. Well, good evening to all of you. It's a high privilege for me to be here at uh, Iowa State. And uh, Jim, you certainly did your homework on that introduction. Thank you. You mentioned the fact that I'd been in the Congress for 17 terms or 34 years. I'll tell you about a very bad mistake I made when I retired. It's always a mistake, I think, to do a little bragging, and I said that uh, during my 34 years in the Congress and my final news conference there, that I had voted over 13,000 times. I went back to my office, had a phone call from a constituent. He said, Lee, I understand you retiring after 34 years. I said, yes. He said, I understand you cast 13,000 votes. I said, yes. He said, well, I want you to know that as you announce your retirement tonight, you finally made a decision I agree with. <laughs> I want to say, first of all, what a rare experience I've had here for the last few hours. I want to thank Steve and uh, Janet for their extraordinary hospitality. We just had dinner at the President's house. I went to college for four years. I never got in the President's house. Uh, here I come one day on this campus and I get to eat with the President and it was a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, I remember Chuck Manette very well. Uh, he was a politician's politician. When I tell you, uh, Tom, you made a beautiful statement about uh, Chuck. But I tell you what I remember about him more than anything else. He had in his bones the feeling of what you have to do to make this country work. He understood that with freedom comes duty. With responsibility, with uh, liberty comes responsibility. And he was determined determined to make his corner of the world better. I don't know of a better example to counter the cynicism and apathy that we find in this country so often. I'm sure not at this university uh, than Chuck Manette. And I want to thank the families, Michelle, you especially. She's the one that made me succeed as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee a few years back. <laughs> And Jim McCormick was a staff member of mine. He was an American political science fellow. He came to work in my office. And you all know the secret to a good uh, success in the Congress, and that's to have a lot of staff people a lot brighter than you. And Jim was certainly qualified at that point, and it was a marvelous experience for me uh, to have him with us. So this has been a great day for me. And I thank you for inviting me for this 10th anniversary lecture. Now I want to talk to you about a fairly serious matter. And that's the challenges that confront the United States and the world after Iraq and Afghanistan. 
I assume, like uh, apparently most of the American people, if I read the New York Times correctly today, that you are putting Afghanistan and Iraq in the rearview mirror. The question is not whether we are coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan. We are. The question is at, the pay, at what pace. And there's going to be a good bit of debate about that, and there should be in the country. But my focus tonight will not be on those two countries, but on the kind of a world we live in as we move away from these two countries. If you think about it, the American foreign policy has been fixated on Iraq and Afghanistan for 10 years or more. And now we're leaving those countries and we are reorienting, if you would, American foreign policy. So I want to talk first about the central realities in the world. I'm going to mention four of them. You may agree with me, you may not. I don't really care because I'm not running for anything. <laughs> and I'll give you the four that I think are the central realities. You know, every now and then you have so many headlines that kind of overwhelm us. But every now and then it's a good idea to put your feet up on the table and look out the window and ask yourself the question, now what's really important that's going on in this world? And that's what I try to do when I talk about the central realities. Before I do that, I want to give you a quick historical glance at America's role in the world. Listen to these. George Washington, he said we should emphasize, quote, this was his foreign policy, extending our commercial relations. Then there was John Quincy Adams. He had the quote that, very popular these days among a certain political viewpoint. He said that, go not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Washington and Jefferson, as you probably know, discouraged the United States from entering into entangling alliances. Now, let's fast forward to more recent presidents. When Chuck Manette and I began in politics, we listened to that young senator from Massachusetts, and he and I can both remember, I'm sure, John F. Kennedy, who said this, we will pay any price, we'll bear any burden, we'll meet any hardship, we'll support any friend, we'll oppose any foe to assure the survival and success of, of liberty. Bill Clinton said America stands alone as the indispensable nation. George W. Bush said we should strive to end tyranny in the world. He said our nation is chosen by God and commissioned by history to be a model for the world. Now these presidents, each speaking in very special historical circumstances, give, as you can tell, very, very different views of what the United States role in the world ought to be. This is not an academic question. It cuts to the very heart of what this country is all about and what we want it to be. And for the American people, you who have to bear the burden of presidential decisions, with regard to taxes and sometimes lives, the answer to the questions these presidents have wrestled with is not an academic matter, but enormously important for our individual lives. Okay, that's the presidential view. Let's take a view at these central realities that I talked about. The first one I don't think there would be much disagreement upon. And that is the preeminence of American power. We remain today 
the world's number one power, militarily, economically, technologically, politically, culturally. It is the central player of the United States in every region of the world. It is the only player with a global reach. That said, as you very well know, we face an enormous number of challenges in this country, each of which has the potential to sap our power and our resources. We are not the unchallenged global power that we were only a few years ago in the 1990s. And despite the challenges we face, it is a reasonably good bet that the United States will remain more powerful than any other state in the world in the coming decades, provided, of course, we accept the challenges that we are confronted with. Now, there's a lot of criticism of our leadership. There's no doubt about that. But the fact of the matter is, the world still looks to the United States for leadership. If you go to Washington today, and you're standing out on the street corner very long, I can almost guarantee you, you'll see a motorcade go by. You may not get a glance at the person in the motorcade, the important person, but it's a prime minister, or it's a king, or it's a finance minister, or it's a treasury secretary. It's a very important person. Why do they all come to Washington? They come to Washington because they look to Washington for leadership. Sometimes they want money. Sometimes they want trade. Sometimes they want a photo op with the president. They come for all sorts of reasons. But they come to the United States because they know that if you're going to make things move in this world, you have to have American support to do it. So we remain, with all of the problems, preeminent. Central reality number one. Central reality number two is the shifting alignment of the great powers. New power centers are emerging. I think since the fall of the Soviet Union, we have probably seen a more fluid world power alignment at any time I can remember, and maybe any time in recent history. China is on the track now to become the largest economy in the world in 2030. Again, if you sit down at a table in Washington to discuss foreign policy, I'll guarantee you that conversation will not go on for more than five or ten minutes before somebody mentions China. Washington today is fixated on China, as we are in many parts of this country. China and India are rapidly on the rise. Brazil, Indonesia, Turkey are becoming regional powers. The old powers are changing. Have you noticed what's happened to the European Union in recent months? They're a bigger economy than ours. They got more people than we have. And yet, they are in a crisis, aren't they? An economic, a political, and a social crisis. And Europe is in decline as Asia is rising. And then Russia. Russia lurches between democracy and authoritarianism, between engagement with the world and estrangement. And it really wouldn't be all that significant were it not for the veto power and nuclear weapons. The overall trend is very clear. The trend is towards more centers of global power with a dramatic shift towards Asia. China and India being the principal countries. Did you see what the president said the other day? Did you read that statement when he was talking about U.S. prosperity and what we had to do? He said this, and I quote him, we cannot put our people back to work unless the Asia-Pacific region is successful 
as an engine of the world. That is an extraordinary statement coming from a president of the United States. We cannot be successful in our economy unless Asia comes back and becomes prosperous. Now it's far from certain how enduring the alignments that are being created now will prevail or not in the years ahead. We are in a period of changing distribution of global power and that is the second reality. The third reality is the mega trend. It is globalization. The influence of globalization is profound. This growing hyper interconnectedness across borders, ideas, technology, labor, capital, transportation, capital flows, jobs, goods and services. It touches every aspect of our lives and it is the most important reality in the world today. And with it comes all kinds of interdependence. We have an automobile plant in Greensburg, Indiana. I went to see that plant not long ago. Their production was being held up. Why? A flood in Bangkok, Thailand. You pick up the paper today and you read about the New York Stock Exchange and what, is they, what are they fixed on? The Greek debt problem. That's been bouncing around and made our stock market bounce around day after day after day in this country. Debt problems in Portugal and Spain and Italy and Ireland send tremors through our economic system. So globalization is a a powerful tool for prosperity. I would argue, you may argue, that globalization is a positive development in the world, but there's one big problem with it. The big problem is that globalization is not global. It creates winners, a lot of them, more I think than losers, but it also creates losers. It does not provide access to the opportunities and the benefits of economic growth to all. Globalization then is good and it's bad. I go to a plant, again in my state of Indiana. I'm standing shaking hands at the door. This is a few years ago. You know how politicians do that in front of a plant gate. The women come up to me. It's a sewing plant where they sew shirts together. And they said, Hamilton, did you read that notice on the door? And the, the notice on the door said, this plant closes 30 days from today. Okay. You're a woman. You earn your living sewing shirts. You're usually a second income in a family. And you come to work one day. This plant has been in that particular community for 50, 75 years and it's closing. Hamilton, why is that happening? And so I start using the word globalization. And believe you me, I learned never ever to use that word. It's a cuss word for a lot of people. They don't understand it. But what they do understand is that it meant their jobs are lost. Globalization. Losers and they can produce those shirts more cheaply in Honduras than they can in southern Indiana. So today more people see globalization as a bad thing and see it positively if you look at the polls. And now the fourth reality. First one, America's preeminent. Second, shifting alignment of powers. Third, globalization. Fourth, I don't know, this is kind of a catch-all. Turmoil in the world. I picked up the paper not too long ago. I read in a very small little column that over the last decade, four million Africans in the Great Basin area 
had been killed. Four million. Now look, I read the papers as carefully as anybody. I look at the uh, newscasts regularly. I didn't know about that. Who cares? Four million people didn't even attract the attention of our media. Certainly didn't attract the attention of the politicians. Turmoil in the world. Sometimes important to us, sometimes we ignore it, as we did in this case. But all around us, economic, cultural, political convulsion, weak governments, civil wars, epidemic disease, environmental and population crises, terrorism and proliferation. President's over in Korea now, or was, maybe he's on his way back. Can't keep track of him these days. But he went over there because of proliferation concerns, didn't he? We're afraid that materials, nuclear materials, will get into the hands of bad people. And so they have a big international meeting on it and try to figure out how to stop that from happening. And there are a slew of other challenges. And then I pick up a Pentagon report the other day. I wouldn't recommend picking up a Pentagon report. <laughs> unless you want to go to sleep. But there was a phrase that caught my eye. We are, the Pentagon says, in an era of persistent conflict. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? Took a top-level bureaucrat to think of that one. You know what it means? Endless war is what it means. It means that for 10 years in this country we've known nothing but war. And if you look back to World War II and you see the number of times we've been engaged in wars and compare it to the number of years when we've been at peace, you'll be shocked because we've been in war after war after war. Persistent conflict. Do you and I have to get accustomed to persistent conflict? Is that the way the world is supposed to operate? I hope not. But it bothers me that the Pentagon of all places has to point that out to us. Okay, four central realities. You may want to add a little to what I said. You may want to subtract. I don't really care. Those are my four central realities. Now let me talk for a minute about not the central realities, but the the challenges we're going to front, confront in this new world. You go home tonight, sit down and write down the major foreign policy challenges this country faces. That's what I tried to do here with this list. You know what I put at the top? I suspect you would not. Nuclear proliferation. I don't think we think much about it. We should, but we don't. We've had reasonable success. We've had a world regime where relatively few countries have become nuclear powers. Today, we're very worried, of course, about Iraq and North Korea. Why should we be worried about nuclear proliferation? It's because there are a growing number of nations that either possess nuclear arms or are getting mighty close to possessing nuclear arms. They have differing motives. They have differing aims. They have different kinds of leadership and it makes the world a lot more dangerous place when people who are not responsible actors get their hands on nuclear weapons. We estimated in the 9-11 Commission if a nuclear weapon goes off in downtown Manhattan, 500,000 people are killed. Now listen folks, you can't get your mind around that. We lost 3,000 people on 9-11 and we cannot all see the enormous impact that had on our psyche, on our country, on our government, on our private enterprises. 3,000. 500,000. How, how would we respond to that in this country? Could we respond to it? That's why I put nuclear proliferation at the top. 
And we know what we have to do. And it's a tough course, of course. We've got to enforce those sanctions. We've got to expand and reinvigorate the non-proliferation regime that I talked of a moment ago. We've got to develop safeguards to ensure civilian programs remain peaceful. Okay, that's one challenge. A second challenge would be the challenge of global economy. I don't think I need to emphasize that much very much, but we've gotten an idea in the recent years of how, how fragile the world economy is and how much it impacts the United States of America this interdependent world of ours the near collapse of the economic of the economy of the United States and of the West because of our problems a few years back and here's the big question I bet you haven't even thought about it I used to work, as Jim said, at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington. And one of the things I had the pleasure of doing there is meeting top flight scholars and academics and policy makers from all over the world. And one of the things that impressed me was just this point. What economic model will emerging countries emulate? state capitalism in China or our capitalism in the United States? Now you say, well, that's an easy question. Well, it is an easy question for you and me. We believe in the free market system. We believe it has led to great prosperity in this country. There's no question about it. We don't even think about it. It's a premise. But it is not a premise in the emerging world. China's had a growth rate of what? Nine or ten percent, isn't it? Over the last ten years, right? Okay, what have we had? Well, we're struggling to get to one percent. And we went down a few years back. Now put yourself in the third world, what we used to call the third world or the emerging world. You look at the China example. You look at the United States, and you got at the very least, you got a few questions in your mind. So, the question of what you do in the world economy is hugely significant challenge for us. And of course, what it has to say to us is we've got to get our own economic house in order if we're going to be a world leader. I'll go into that if I have time, but I'm not sure I'm going to have time. My goodness. How'd I get so wound up on this? <laughs> I've got a terrific speech here. It's a three-hour speech. I can't, I can't ever get anybody to listen to it. That's the problem. <laughs> Let me move on. A third challenge, of course, is to get the United States economy going. Now, let me step on a few toes here. We got a very tough economic problem in this country today. No question about that. Everybody in this room, I think, would say that the free market is a great force for economic progress. Nobody would doubt that. But in my view, now is not the time to slam on the fiscal brakes. You've got a question of timing here. You read what the Federal Reserve Chairman said yesterday. I hope you did. Everybody reads that, don't they? Is that required reading at uh, Iowa State? Well, if it ought to be. He said, in effect, we've got to have more stimulus right now. Now, you also got a huge problem out here, and that's the debt. It's a huge problem. I do not believe that debt will ever be paid off without economic growth. You have to have economic growth, or you're not going to get it paid off. So in the short term, I would argue, not everybody agrees with this, obviously, that in the short term, you have to have some stimulus, both in the private and in the public sector. In the medium term, you've got to put into place a genuine, creditable 
deficit reduction plan, which will take hold in a two, three years out. The Republicans are absolutely right. That's hard for me to admit. I'm a Democrat. When they say we've got to get that fiscal problem resolved, we've got to solve that debt problem. They're right about that. The Democrats are right too, aren't they? When they talk about the necessity of economic growth and making sure we have investments in the proper areas, education, research, infrastructure. So that's a big challenge. And you see the link here? You have to have a strong economy before you can have a strong America. And America's leadership in the world depends upon our ability to get our economic house in order. And if we don't get that economic house in order, we are not going to be the leader of the world. It's as simple as that, but it's hard, very hard to achieve. I think energy and the environment is another big challenge for us. If you ask me what's the great failure, you didn't ask me, I'll tell you anyway. What's the great failure of American foreign policy in the last couple of decades. It's the failure to develop a viable energy policy. I told my friends at dinner the, uh, a little bit ago, I got out a speech of mine I gave on the floor of the House of Representatives back in the 1970s. I'm sure you all remember it very well. I could give that exact same speech tonight on the floor of the House of Representatives, changing only a word or two. We haven't learned anything, or very little, with regard to energy policy in this country. Every president I've known since Richard Nixon, I've worked with nine of them, every president I've known since Richard Nixon has said, we've got to get energy independence. That's the wrong goal, incidentally, but that's the way he articulated it. And we may be getting there, if you've read the papers recently. Not because of our foreign policy successes, but because of natural gas and a lot of other things that are happening in the world energy markets. And uh, the next challenge, I'll go on, I'll, I'll finish here in a few minutes, Jim. Relax. Three hours. Three hours, okay. U.S.-China relationship. I told you Washington was fixated on China. It's the most important bilateral relationship in the world. When you go home tonight and you sit down and uh, write all of those uh, challenges you think we confront, I'll tell you this, we won't solve a one of them without China's help. You're going to solve climate change without China's help? You're going to solve the drug problem without China's help? You're going to solve terrorism without China's help? It goes on and on and on. They're our only peer competitor. You know its economy is growing at breakneck speed. You know they're expanding their military. But it's also a country with intrinsically a lot of fundamental problems. The question is whether or not that political system can keep that economy going, in a sense. I don't see evidence that China wants to start a war with the United States. I pick up a paper every now and then and see some American politician talking in a very hostile way towards China. I don't agree with that. This, look, this is a difficult relationship. It's a hard one. We've simply got to keep working towards a more comprehensive, cooperative framework with China. Keep talking. Focus on the things we have in common. Keep the communications open. And make sure that every interaction you have with that country is as positive as it can be. The great foreign policy questions of this century will involve China. Can it be peacefully managed? Can it become a stakeholder in the international system? Those are the big questions. Okay, one or two more of these, and then I'll quit. Well, I don't know. I may go on a little while. I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> Cybersecurity. If I were giving this speech a year ago or 18 months ago, I wouldn't have included this. But today, if you looked at the FBI director's testimony 
of about a month ago, you learned that he believes that cybersecurity is the number one security threat to the United States. Not terrorism, cybersecurity. We got this electrical financial communication system with all of this interlocking grids. They connect us to all kinds of important services, utilities and water and transportation and communication. And somebody over there, a bright teenager, can disrupt it. And one of the problems is you don't know whether it's a person or a country. And you can't find out easily. I don't think Director Mueller is wrong. I think he's right. This is a very serious national security problem. And incidentally, young people, if you want to get a job when you leave this university, then you school yourselves in cyber security. Because we're really going to need talent in that area in the years ahead. We've got to invest a lot more heavily in our offensive and our defensive capabilities. One of the big problems is that most of these things I've talked about, the infrastructure that create the vulnerabilities are owned by the private sector. But the private sector doesn't know how to stop these attacks. Government may or may not know how to stop the attacks. But there has to be more sharing of information and when you talk to a major corporate head about sharing information, they get very nervous. And they should get nervous because they're worried about proprietary interests. But unless that information is shared, they're not going to be able to have the defenses they need against cyber attacks. The threat of terrorism is another challenge. I'll not go into that. I do not believe terrorism is an existential threat to the United States. Is it a serious threat? Yes, it's a serious threat. But not, it's not disappearing. It is lessening. It's not an existential threat. Well, I think I'll have to skip over an awful lot of very good material here. And I'll try to finish up. Um, sometimes I'm asked, maybe you are too. Hamilton, are you pessimistic or optimistic about the future? of the country. You ever heard that question? <laughs> you know what my answer is? It's a little facetious. You won't like it. I'll give it to you anyway. What difference does it make? What difference does it make what you and I think about it? We don't know. We're guessing. I got on my desk back at the office in Bloomington, Indiana, a stack of books on I, uh, world strategy, whatever you call it, geopolitics. Some of the best thinkers in the country, people I know and respect, and they're really trying to answer this question. Should we be optimistic or pessimistic about the future of the country? Nobody really knows, not even these, not even these very smart people. What is far more important than what we think about the nation's future is what we do about the nation's future. We have to do our part. That's what Chuck Manette was all about. He saw the responsibility to do his part wherever he was, on a farm in Iowa or a fancy law firm, Tom, excuse me that, fancy law firm in Los Angeles. It is a fancy law firm, no denying it, it's good, and a good one. And you can pay me later, Tom, if you want. <laughs> That's what's important. My guess, my hope, is that this country will respond to the challenges that we confront, that we will continue to be a world's leader. But I don't know that. I, I hear all of these speeches by politicians. You ever heard a politician get up and say, well, I'm an optimist? I bet you've never heard one get up and say, I'm a pessimist. They're all optimists. And that's a good thing, probably. But the fact of it is, on these big questions, we don't really know. All we can do is try to make our corner of the world a little better. Abraham Lincoln put it right, didn't he? Whether this nation so conceived and dedicated can long endure. 
That was the operational question at Gettysburg. But it's the operational question today. Whether this nation, so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. And it isn't written in the stars anywhere. It isn't carved in Indiana limestone anywhere. That this nation will always be number one. We've risen to the occasion, and let me just conclude with this. If you look at all of the things that challenge us there, good, good outcomes are possible in every one of the challenges that I mentioned, but bad outcomes are possible too. The future could bring order. The future could bring chaos. We don't know. But what we do know is that American leadership is really going to count. I'll conclude with that. Thank you. I don't know. Do you have questions? Do you want to take questions? Now, these, these young people got to get back and study. They got to study for these exams. If they want to get up and walk out, it's okay with me. I've walked out on more important meetings than anybody in this room. <laughs> it will not embarrass me in the slightest, so go right ahead. But I'll take three or four questions. Is that about right? Well, I'll tell you what. We're going to give you a plaque here a minute. Oh, okay. Tom and Michelle want to come up, and then we'll open it up for questions. Mm -hmm. Oh, my. We gotta get somewhere. Oh, you want us to? Shall we come down? Okay. Yeah, as people are leaving, I'm David Oliver. I'm the interim dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, overpowered. And we'd like to thank Congressman Hamilton for his presence in time tonight. Presenting with a flat commemorating the 10th and Okay. Is this working? Yeah. We've got time for a few questions. If you didn't have a question from that talk, you weren't lit. So. Sure, go. Was the war in Iraq worth it? I did not favor the war in Iraq. Um, I think it's a mistake, a very grave mistake in American foreign policy. Having said that, the decision was made to go ahead, and we have to get the best result we can under the circumstances. I do not favor cutting and running, as the phrase goes. We, we cannot possibly achieve our major objectives. We've long since given up on that. But we want to try to leave behind in Iraq some measure of stability and to make sure that in either Afghanistan or Iraq, they do not have a safe haven for Al-Qaeda. So I, um, I think it was a very grave mistake for the United States. But having made it the decision, we have to make the best of it. It's, it's not in our interest simply to cut and run. Uh, uh, to, to eliminate what? Hypocrisy. In our position? Yes. And you mean by that? Uh, first, uh, as long as you achieve nuclear capability before the regime was instituted, it's okay. And also countries that uh, get along better with the United States and current yeah. are... Look, you put your finger on a very important point that most of us don't understand. <clears throat> our position in arguing non-proliferation, looking at it from a different point of view, not our point of view, is you Americans can have the nuclear weapon, but you don't want us to have it, right? 
Now that's a tough sell. If you're trying to make that sale to a, another country. How do we do it? I think we can make a very strong case that look, these weapons are so awesome and so destructive that it is not in anybody's interest to have a spread of these weapons to irresponsible actors. And that it is in everybody's interest that nuclear weapons be contained and controlled within an international regime at which we've had some success, not complete success, in the last several decades. But uh, we have to recognize the hypocrisy, as you put it, uh, and the, the burden of persuasion. I think we can argue that we have been responsible in the use of nuclear power, to which they will respond, you're the only country that ever dropped a bomb in anger. But that's a long time ago and under very difficult historical circumstances. Overall, the United States has been in the front of trying to create a responsible nuclear regime. And we continue to be. Every president, Republican and Democrat, has tried to do that. And I think it's an important part of our policy. Yeah, we'll take these two and that'll wrap it up, yeah, okay? I've told these guys about everything I know. Okay, let's go. I had a similar question. Is that, okay, cool. Um, I actually had a similar question. Um, I was wondering, when you refer to irresponsible actors, are you talking about specific countries or organizations or individuals? That's a question. For irresponsible actors in the nuclear regime, countries, individuals, organizations. Name them. Well, <laughs> well, obviously, look, uh, a country loaning nuclear weapons like Pakistan gives me a lot of heartburn. You and I spend a hundred million of dollars a year, we give it to Pakistan, and you say, secure these nuclear weapons. You know what they tell us? We'll do it. You can't check on us. Trust us. I get nervous about that. And you say, well, you shouldn't give them a hundred million dollars. Well, where's that get you? Makes it worse, probably. It worries me if Iran gets the nuclear weapon. It worries me with nuclear energy and nuclear weapons in North Korea. You've got a lot of irresponsible people out there. This guy, what's his name, Khan in Pakistan that spread nuclear information all around the world, is a dangerous actor. And we have to re support responsible international regimes. Now, when it comes down to nuclear weapons, you're really talking about the United States and Russia. We're the ones that have them. And so when President Bush and President Obama talk about negotiating with the Russians to lower the number of nuclear weapons, I think they're on the right track. And it's going to be a tough haul. OK, so I had one quick follow-up. Um, when you're referring, like, I guess, to smaller uh, powers that, or actors that you're trying to prevent from getting nuclear uh, capabilities, do you feel as if the smaller actors who do want nuclear capabilities are looking toward getting a political foothold? or um, Because obviously a lot of these states wouldn't really have economic capabilities of you know, having a delivery system of any kind. Well, I think they see nuclear uh, obtaining the capability to develop nuclear weapons as a very important uh, measure of their national prestige. North Korea is a country that is utterly poor, can't feed their own people, as you know. But we have to pay attention to North Korea because they have the nuclear weapon. Now, other countries around the world take notice of that. They notice that the United States has to deal with North Korea. And what lessons do they draw? Last question, and then we'll... Hi. OK, oh. this will be the last one. Where do you think that the uh, the competition for uh, for the dwindling world's resources fit into this globalization and competition that you were talking about? I mean, we've got increased supply from or increased demand from these international, these rising powers. 
where uh, and we have decreasing supply, do you think that that's going to make a more um, more competition in the world, or do you think it's going to lead to more innovation? I think these resources become uh, a question of American national security. Uh, I didn't say anything about it this evening because I skipped over a couple of paragraphs, but water, for example, is becoming a hugely important, and has been for years, but is becoming more so a hugely important national security issue because countries must have access to fresh water uh, in order for their country to survive. And they're going to do what's necessary to get access to that water. If you look at the problems in the Middle East today, they're very complex, of course, but uh, oftentimes you find at the base of it uh, concern about water. So we have to begin to think in the, of these resources in terms not just of the importance of those resources for production, manufacturing, or whatever, but also in terms of the impact they can have or the lack of access to them can have on the stability of the region. And it becomes then a national security concern that the natural resources be shared. Okay, let's thank uh, Congressman Hamilton one more time. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, thank you. We've, we've got some refreshments right here next door when the lights come up, so if you'd like to stop for a while and talk about the future of the world, that would be wonderful. 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 That would be wonderful.